Can a bone spur cause paralysis? Yesterday, I presented the case of a 65-year-old male who came to my office complaining of progressive troubles with his walking and balance. Neurologically, he had a spastic gait as well as hyperreflexia, and those are signs of spinal cord compression. I mentioned that he had a positive Hoffman sign, clonus, and a positive Babinski sign. So let's talk about what those are. A Hoffman sign is when you can take a patient's hand, hold the distal part of their finger, and flick the end of their finger. And if you flick the end of the finger and the hands contract like this, that's called a positive Hoffman sign. The Babinski reflex is when you take something dull and rub it in this direction on the bottom of a patient's foot. If the toes curl down, that's actually a normal reflex. But if the toes curl up like this, that's a positive reflex or a sign of spinal cord compression. I also mentioned that the patient had positive clonus. So what happens if you take a patient's foot and promptly jerk it up, nothing should happen. But if they do have spinal cord compression, if you jerk the foot up, you'll get beats of clonus where the foot will shake. On the MRI of a cervical spine, we see severe compression of the patient's spinal cord at C5 and C6. The CT scan is more terrifying because what we're actually seeing is that all this compression is actually calcification or bone spurs. This is called OPLL or ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. The what? Our spine is held together by a lot of ligamentous tissues and the major ones are the ALL and the PLL or the anterior longitudinal ligament that sits on the front of the vertebral bodies and the posterior longitudinal ligament which sits behind the vertebral bodies and lies within the spinal canal. And that posterior longitudinal ligament can actually become calcified like in this CT scan. When it becomes calcified, it can actually compress the spinal cord and cause symptoms of cervical myelopathy. Now, what's interesting is that in most populations, the prevalence of OPLL is anywhere from half to 1% of the population. But in the Japanese population, it's 2 to 4%. So we know that there is some genetic component to predisposing people to developing OPLL. But beyond that, the symptoms primarily present in patients in their 50s and 60s, and it's twice as common in men than women. If there is any concern for OPLL, it's best to get a CT scan because it's so much easier to detect on CT than it is on MRI. Given my patient's history, he needs surgery, but how do we go about it? You can see how much room the spinal cord occupies up here, but down here where the calcification is present, there is very little room for his cord. So we should just come anteriorly and remove all those bone spurs, right? Actually wrong, that is a very risky operation. To come anteriorly or through the front of the patient's neck and remove the bone and bone spurs is extremely risky in OPLL patients because the calcified ligament is actually integrated with the dura. That means in these cases, there is an extremely high risk of a spinal fluid leak if we access through the front. Now, I'm not saying that you can't do it, but it is high risk. So the surgeon has to weigh the risk and benefits of the operation, determine what approach is best for that patient. Here's an example of a posterior approach where we can come on the back of the patient's neck and decompress the area where the spinal cord is impinged and do a fusion or place rods and screws to stabilize that segment of the spine. In my particular patient, we went through the risks and benefits of an anterior versus a posterior approach, and we decided that it was best to come through a posterior decompression infusion. The operation took about two hours, and he stayed for two days in the hospital before going home. He was up and walking the day after surgery, and after about six months, he began to notice continued improvement in his balance and his weakness. 12 months after surgery, he's continued to do fantastic and has regained almost all of his strength back and has had no more balance troubles. That's why it's so important to understand the pathophysiology of spine problems and the risks and benefits of surgery and what that may entail in a particular patient. If we had not suspected OPLL and done that CT scan to make the diagnosis, his outcome could have been very different. That's why it's so important to examine each patient and carefully go through the differential diagnosis. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care with an excellent outcome. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.